Pink Talk. That's again uh, Friday at 10. Um, so I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Professor Sanjit Sesha. He is an assistant professor here in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences Department, and his research interests are in dependable computing and comp computational logic, with the current focus on applied automated formal methods to problems in embedded systems, electronic design automation, computer security, and program analysis. So please join me in welcoming Professor Sesha. Okay, thank you. It's, it's a real pleasure uh, to speak uh, in the Citrus seminar series. Um, I'll be speaking today about um, techniques to make computers uh, more dependable, computer-based systems more dependable, um, techniques that apply at uh, all the traditional levels of computing abstraction, all the way from high-level models uh, to software down to circuits. And in particular, um, uh, the focus will be on a class of techniques uh, known as formal methods. Um, also, uh, this work that I'll be today, uh, talking about today is, uh, is the collaboration with uh, several excellent students and some amazing colleagues, uh, both here and uh, elsewhere. Um, so uh, to start with, um, I want to give you a few instances uh, of uh, 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 situations where we need uh, uh, dependable computing. Um, yesterday, for example, was uh, election day. and. Um, uh, a significant fraction of the, the U.S. electorate, uh, about 25% of registered voters, um, had to use paperless electronic voting machines. Um, and uh, this was a, approximately in about 11 states in the country. Um, and as uh, several of uh, us are aware, uh, there are significant concerns about uh, uh, electronic voting machines, in particular about correctness. You know, are there bugs uh, that are introduced that can cause things to go wrong? Um, and also about security. Uh, are there uh, loopholes uh, that can be exploited by malicious parties? Um, so uh, in particular, we, have, we read a lot about this in the news. Um, and in this talk, I'll focus in particular about correctness. Um, so although there are significant security issues with electronic voting machines, uh, a lot of issues are actually bugs uh, that cause significant uh, problems uh, when uh, these machines are used on election day. So if you look, for instance, at uh, the first news item, it talks about an instance uh, a few years ago where uh, voters complained that they selected a particular candidate, but the screen showed another candidate as being selected. Um, the, the example at the bottom of the slide talks about a, a bug where when the voter dragged their finger a little bit across the screen, uh, the machine would just crash and uh, it wasn't clear what exactly was going on there. So, um, so there are all of these concerns, bugs, uh, uh, that we have to deal with. Um, and um, I talk about this in more detail later in the talk um, and show you in a little video uh, if that, of showing how the testing is currently done and how things might go wrong. Um, another class of uh, systems for which uh, dependability is paramount is um, this new uh, class systems, uh, a new, this uh, new term that's used to describe them, known as cyber physical systems. So cyber physical systems are, are computers that are networked and tightly integrated with uh, physical processes. Uh, a good example of this are uh, today's automobiles. Uh, today's automobiles have a significant amount of software uh, running on uh, microcontrollers that are networked uh, in the car. Uh, but they're also, of course, integrated with the traditional uh, mechanical and electrical systems in the car, uh, like engines. Uh, and so that's a, a good example of uh, what a cyber-physical system is. Uh, but there are many other examples of cyber-physical systems all around us, uh, right from the, uh, the systems for control and management of buildings, such as this one, uh, systems for uh, power generation and distribution, uh, telecommunications, factory automation, and, and so forth. One of the things that's, that's, that's changed, I guess, significantly over the last uh, uh, several years uh, is the increasing amount of software in cyber-physical systems. So to just take an example, uh, today's cars literally run on software. Um, here are some statistics uh, from a recent IEEE Spectrum article uh, for uh, um, a car such as uh, the, the, the Mercedes-Benz uh, S-Class that's shown over here. Uh, these vehicles can, uh, have various systems where the software cumulatively uh, can be nearly 100 million lines of code. And as a point of comparison, um, uh, the amount of software for the, the, the onboard systems in the Boeing 787 is, uh, is less than that. 
Um, so all of this software is running on several microprocessors that are networked, so 70 to 100 uh, was the estimate in this article. Um, so clearly we need uh, techniques to be able to analyze that these software controlled uh, cyber physical systems work correctly. Um, and an area that, uh, that makes this point uh, particularly um, uh, uh, directly is the area of medical devices. So medical devices increasingly are also software controlled. Um, and uh, a bug in the software could potentially have uh, life-threatening consequences. So here's an article from a medical journal about uh, an incident that happened due to a software bug in a pacemaker. Uh, so uh, the article relates that um, uh, the patient um, uh, was uh, walking uh, towards the cashier after refueling his car when he just collapsed. And then uh, over the next week, uh, it, the patient had a general feeling of unwell-being. Um, and when the doctors diagnosed it, it turned out it was a bug in the software in the pacemaker. Um, it turned out that there was one setting out of a total of about 12,000 where uh, the software could have a timing error and it would uh, cause the pacemaker to pace at uh, rates up to 185 beats per minute, so faster than the prescribed pacing rate uh, for that patient. Um, so this is a case where there is a, a timing error in the code that results in incorrect operation uh, with potentially uh, life-threatening consequences. So uh, cyber physical systems is the second area that I will talk about in, in this talk, and in particular I talk about the challenges of verifying timing-related properties in these systems. Finally, as if these challenges weren't enough, uh, we also have to deal with um, uh, the faults at the, the hardware level. So today's uh, circuits, uh, today's devices are scaling down to 32 nanometers and below. And um, in addition to the, the traditional kinds of uh, bugs that uh, we've had to deal with in, in hardware, uh, we also have to deal with um, defects uh, due to manufacturing, um, uh, variations, um, uh, thermal effects, and, and also uh, the effect of transient bit flips in uh, state holding elements and, and gates on, on, the dis on the chip. So you might wonder um, if uh, these kinds of low level faults can indeed cause significant uh, system failures. And uh, although it's true that many of these faults uh, do get masked, uh, it's possible that a single bit flip can have fairly uh, far reaching consequences. So here's uh, an article that was posted on Amazon's website uh, about um, outages uh, that, that occurred in the data centers that Amazon operates. Uh, this particular uh, um, situation happened about two years ago where um, uh, at around 8.40 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, uh, they noticed that uh, a lot of their servers started failing. Uh, that is, requests weren't really completing successfully. And it took about eight hours for them to fix this. Uh, so at only around 4 o'clock or 4.58 p.m. P, uh, Pacific time, um, the error rates returned to the normal level. And it turned out that the cause of these failures were, were a handful of single bit corruptions in messages. Um, and a single bit corruption was the cause of a, of a failure in the protocol that they used in these data centers, uh, known as a gossip protocol, where what happened was, because of these uh, uh, bit corruptions, um, a lot of these servers were just gossiping all the time and not uh, uh, servicing requests. So, um, so here's an example of the impact of a single bit flip uh, leading to a nearly eight hour outage at uh, Amazon's worldwide data centers. Um, so uh, I hope these three examples have, sh have illustrated that uh, we need to think about dependability at, at all levels of uh, computing abstraction, uh, all the way from high level models uh, down to hardware. And uh, we need all the techniques that we can get uh, to address these problems. Um, in particular, my interest uh, and that of several others uh, in the, in the computing, computing science community uh, is in a class of techniques called uh, formal methods. And uh, uh, formal methods, I think, have a lot to uh, um, contribute to improving the dependability of systems. So formal methods are, are mathematical techniques um, for the specification design and verification of systems. And ideally, uh, these techniques uh, should be automated. We should have automated tool support uh, to help us analyze uh, uh, system correctness and dependability. Uh, so by specification, I mean that 
uh, we describe what the system is supposed to do uh, using uh, mathematical objects like finite automata or a uh, system of differential equations or uh, a set of logical formulas and so forth. Um, the design, f formal methods for design are really about coming up with well-grounded mathematical design principles and algorithms, for instance, to synthesize uh, correct systems from specifications. And then finally, uh, verification techniques uh, are geared towards answering the question of whether the system uh, indeed meets its specifications. So um, a, a particular example of a formal method uh, that's proved quite successful is model checking. Um, so uh, in model checking, uh, the, uh, 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 the scenario is as follows. You start with a program and a specification uh, that you want the program to have. And uh, from the program, typically, you extract a formal model. And, um, um, and then the formal model is fed to the model checker along with uh, the specification, which is encoded, in this case, in a, in a formal logic, temporal logic. And then the model checker generates one of two responses. Either it says that, indeed, the program is correct, that it meets the specification, or that it's, it's not correct, it's, it's, there's a bug in it, and it can exhibit an error trace uh, showing how um, the bug manifests itself. So model checking has been found quite, uh, to be very valuable in finding uh, uh, corner case bugs in uh, digital circuits and software. Um, and so in this talk, I want to illustrate how um, formal methods like model checking can be brought to bear on, on problems that they traditionally haven't been applied to. Um, so um, I'll talk um, first about um, how we can think about formal ways of designing uh, electronic voting machines that can ease the testing and verification uh, of these systems. Um, then I'll talk about uh, the problem of timing analysis of software uh, in cyber physical systems. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about how formal methods can be brought to bear uh, in analyzing the impact of low-level faults uh, in uh, hardware. Okay, so let me start uh, talking about electronic voting machines by uh, playing a little video uh, that shows uh, a direct recording electronic voting machine um, being tested. So this is um, from the 2008 election. Um, and uh, the first uh, sequence that I want to show you is just um, uh, how a, a direct electronic voting machine with a touchscreen interface is, uh, uh, operates. Uh, so I apologize for the video quality. But you can see that uh, there are various rectangles in the screen uh, that correspond to various candidates, uh, various choices. Um, and there are different contests. So for instance, the contest for president, um, and then next to it, uh, the contest for the local senator, and then uh, the House for Representatives, and so forth. So um, the way the voting process uh, 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 proceeds is that the voter navigates between different contests and touches the appropriate rectangles to record their choices. Um, and um, once they're done, uh, what just happened was the, the, the voter press, pressed the next button and went to the next screen where uh, uh, there's, there's another issue that they have to vote on. Okay, so that's the general uh, uh, process. Uh, now I want to move ahead and uh, show you an instance where something seems to go wrong. Okay. So, um, so, so what's been happening in between is that this is a test voter. So um, he or she is going back and forth between the different screens, unselecting and selecting various buttons, or pressing in parts of the screen where some, something should not happen. Okay. And so now, uh, let me just play that again. So what happened there? was that they, they pressed the, the button uh, for president, and uh, what got highlighted was uh, uh, the box for the, for the senator. OK, so let's, OK, so you see that? And then um, the voter tries this again. So clearly, this is a bug, right? And um, we'd like to be able to catch this uh, before election day, ideally even before the day before election day when they're doing testing. Right. Okay, so I hope that gives you a sense of uh, uh, the kinds of issues that uh, we're trying to deal with. Uh, so to recap, uh, a typical direct recording electronic voting machine uh, implements uh, 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 the capability to go through a sequence of contests. Each contest is, is a race. Uh, so it's, it's basically a choice 
um, where you have to pick L out of K choices. So for instance, in the contest for president, L is one, so you pick one out of uh, some number of options. And a voter session is a sequence of contests, so a voter would navigate back and forth between different contests, possibly changing their choices, and at the end, they decide that they're happy with what they have, and they decide to cast their vote, and that's the last step of a voter session. So given all these problems, you might wonder why uh, people even want to use electronic voting. And um, there are several uh, uh, disadvantages which are on the right-hand side of the slide, but there are also certain advantages, like uh, increased configurability, um, better usability, especially uh, for um, uh, alternative input devices, accessibility, and so forth. And also, um, there are no ambiguities in, in the cast ballots. So for instance, you, don't have the, you wouldn't have the problem of a hanging chad uh, as we had in the 2000 presidential election. So um, what we'd like to do is come up with design principles uh, that would make uh, it easier to verify and test voting machines. And in particular, um, our contribution was to show that you can combine formal verification with testing by humans, as uh, is currently done. Um, rather than using a design that somebody else created, we decided to um, investigate how we can design the voting machine to ease the task of formal verification. So um, uh, our students uh, created a design of a sim very simple voting machine that we were able to synthesize down to an FPGA. Uh, we did verification of this uh, design using techniques like model checking and SMT solving, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And in particular, uh, we showed that um, by using a little bit of formal verification, you can ease the testing burden uh, to uh, essentially uh, be able to test the machine with a finite polynomial number of tests. Okay, so to start with, let me tell you about what I mean by correctness of the voting machine. So informally, it means that the voting machine should behave as per the voter expectation. Okay, so, uh, but more formally, uh, in order to use formal methods, we have to come up with a more precise definition of, of correctness. So let's, let's see what this means for a single contest. So suppose you have a voter, and the, uh, the, the voting machine is a choice between two candidates, Alice and Bob. So we start out with the voting machine um, state not recording any votes for either candidate. And the voter looks at that screen, no buttons are highlighted, and so uh, their mental model uh, says that, okay, the, the machine is initialized and no votes have been recorded. Then the voter presses the first button, and the intention is that they're voting for Alice. Uh, and so you would expect that the voting machine internally updates its state to, be, to record the vote for Alice, but it also shows that on the screen by highlighting the button for Alice. And now, looking at that screen, uh, the voter receives some feedback to say that the, the state of the machine indeed has recorded the vote for Alice. And what we really want is that uh, the mental model of the voter, the state in the mental model, should match the state inside the, the machine itself. So um, the notion of correctness we use is actually uh, a notion that's, uh, that's much used in the area of formal methods. It's called trace equivalence. Uh, so the idea is that uh, you observe sequences of uh, uh, states that um, uh, occur in the implementation and in the mental model of the tester for a sequence of inputs. So for instance, uh, the implementation might start out in contest number one uh, with no candidates selected. Uh, it displays a screen uh, to that effect. The tester looks at the screen and, uh, and has their own uh, uh, a picture of the state, which is it's in, the machine is in contest one and there are no selections. Then the tester presses a button, so that's an input. Um, the machine updates its state, reflects that in the output screen, and now the tester's uh, mental model also is also updated to be contest one and Alice. So really there's a sequence of states at the bottom, there's a sequence of states inside the machine, and at the top green box, it's a sequence of states in the tester's mental model. And what we want is that these sequences of states should be equal, they should be identical for the same input sequence. Um, so uh, in our, um, uh, the entire work, we come up with a, a, a formal model of a tester, which involves a, a state machine model of the voting process plus uh, an unspecified interpretation function to deal with perception uh, by a human. I won't have time to talk about that uh, in today's lecture, but what I want to focus on is this um, idea that formal verification can ease the testing burden. So let's consider the, the, the question of uh, what tests can be used 
to gain some assurance about the voting machine correctness. Okay, so in this case, a test is really a sequence of inputs, a sequence of button presses, B1, B2, B3, etc., ending in cast. Right? And so the, the state of the machine evolves as you press buttons. And at the end, uh, we have, uh, let's say, a cast vote record, which says that for each contest, what was the uh, choice made by the voter? And of course, the, the mental model of the voter, the state uh, of the voting process evolves as they press these buttons. And what we want is that um, the cast vote record accurately records the votes as the voter intended. Okay? So the question is, what sequences of button presses are sufficient for testing? What is the set of test cases that we can use to be able to uh, um, prove trace equivalence? Now, uh, a priori, uh, this is quite hard because um, you, could, you might end up uh, needing uh, an infinitely uh, many input sequences. And the reason is that um, if you just consider the voting machine as a black box, you don't really know if, for instance, you toggle the button for Alice a hundred times, whether that some hidden logic would then be activated and it would cause something to go wrong. Right? So for instance, for, if you had a single contest and if you just alternated between selecting Alice and Bob, you don't know how many times you should alternate before you see some bad behavior. And um, that makes it quite complicated for uh, testing. So um, this is a place where formal verification can help. Uh, in particular, uh, we can prove a, a set of properties uh, on the implementation, on the code. For instance, we can prove that uh, the voting machine code is a, a, uh, is a deterministic function. Uh, the, the next state function is a deterministic function of certain relevant uh, state variables. Uh, we can also uh, uh, try to prove that um, the, uh, the output screen, the bitmap, uh, correctly represents uh, the internal state. In particular, uh, each unique output screen represents a unique internal state. Um, and if we, if we do this, uh, then for instance, uh, if you go back and look at a screen like this, if you look at this screen, it should really correspond to the internal state where you're in this contest and no candidates are selected, and the next state should not depend on anything other than that current state and the, the input, the button that you provide. It should not depend on any other state in, in the voting machine code. So uh, these are things that we can verify uh, with formal methods. And, and I'll briefly describe uh, how we do it uh, in a couple of slides. Um, now, even if we do this, um, especially in US elections, uh, given that you have multiple contests, even if you said, I'll visit each contest exactly once, you have an exponential number of test cases to deal with. So for instance, uh, in this case, you have three contests. But in the general case, you might have n contests. And especially in California, you have all of these propositions uh, that, you, that one has to also vote on. So n can be quite large. And you can think of each contest as a, as a choice of picking one out of k. So if you have k choices in the first contest, k choices in the second contest, k choices in the third contest, and so forth, you have a total of k to the n possible combinations to test. Um, and so this is a, a huge number uh, of combinations in practice for human-based uh, testing. So uh, this is another place where formal verification can help. Uh, what we showed is that uh, formal verification could re reduce the number of tests from k to the n to simply n times k. And uh, to do that, we verify the following three additional properties. So the first thing we verified on the code is that uh, uh, the, the, the logic for, multi, for different contests is independent. So what you do in contest i does not affect the choice in contest j for j not equal to i. Um, and this actually goes back to the, the little video that I played for you, where uh, the selection in the contest for president was actually it was impacting the state, seemingly impacting the state of the contest for Senate. And this is the kind of thing that we want to avoid. Uh, similarly, you, you might uh, want to prove that uh, the navigation buttons don't affect the, the selection state. So pressing next or previous should not change your selections. And also that the selection button should not affect navigation. So if you, if you select a particular uh, candidate, it shouldn't suddenly, uh, the machine shouldn't suddenly jump to a completely different screen. Okay, so uh, here's how we do this. Uh, this is a very brief summary of uh, the, the, the verification problem we set up. So the problem is of verifying independence uh, of um, uh, different contests, for instance, or 
uh, that the, the machine is deterministic function of certain relevant state. And so uh, the core problem is to verify that uh, a state variable v is a function of uh, a defined set of variables w, uh, containing uh, variables w1 to wk, and nothing else. Um, and the way we do this is we, we essentially um, uh, set up a logical formula that we then try to prove will be valid. It will be true in all cases. Um, so uh, very briefly, uh, here's how we do it. Uh, so on the left-hand side of this slide, I have the, the logical expression. On the right-hand side, I have the English language description of what that logical expression is, is doing. So first thing we do is we, uh, we encode the next state and output functions as logical formulas. And then the second thing is we construct another formula uh, which checks that the value of v is not affected if variables other than w were, were to be changed in a step. So in particular, what, what this is saying is that if I had two executions encoded by these two expressions, um, where uh, the, the state of all the values of all variables in W was kept fixed, the same in both of these, these executions, but the values of other variables could possibly change, then um, I know that the value of V will stay the same in both executions. Okay. So this is uh, the general template uh, that we use to construct these formulas. And then we invoke um, uh, solvers, uh, which are known as satisfiability modulo theory solvers, and uh, if the solver comes back saying the formula is valid, then we're happy. If it comes back saying it's invalid, then there's a bug, and we have to know how to fix the code uh, to get rid of that bug. Okay, so, uh, so that's the brief tour of uh, some of the work we did with electronic voting. Uh, I think the, the, one of the key things we showed is that you can combine formal verification uh, with testing by humans to, in, to particularly ease the, the testing burden. And in particular, I, sh uh, I talked about uh, this way in which we can um, uh, use formal verification to come up with a finite polynomial number of tests to administer. So um, in terms of next steps, we have currently a, uh, a simple design. Um, in order for it to be useful in uh, elections, it, it needs to have additional features, and, and that's something uh, uh, the student is working on. Um, but I think the principles that we, uh, we explored in, in this work on voting uh, can be used in other kinds of interactive systems as well. Um, in particular, in the embedded system world, uh, where you have systems like medical devices or um, uh, in avionics cockpit interfaces, uh, where uh, you really have, it's really an interactive system. You have the human in the loop, and you need some way of systematically testing uh, these kinds of interactive systems. Okay, so that's the end of part one. Um, so now I'm going to uh, change subject and talk about uh, software and cyber-physical systems. Um, so in particular, uh, the problem that I'll be speaking about is to verify timing properties uh, of, uh, of software. So for instance, in, in cars, uh, you might have a program uh, that controls the brakes. And you want to be able to prove that uh, the brake-by-wire software actuates the brakes uh, within a certain time bound, right? So that uh, you get assurance that the brakes are actuated in time. Uh, similarly, we saw this example of pacemaker software earlier, and the question you m one might ask is, is there a bug that might cause the pacemaker software to trigger a pace more frequently than it's prescribed? So um, I want to show you one more example, uh, a little video that illustrates uh, uh, the need for timing verification. So um, in particular, I'll show this factory automation example. Um, so here we have um, uh, the factory floor where there are these three giant robotic arms that are uh, manipulating this car, right? And what you really want is uh, that uh, you want to have these synchronized in time so that you know, if there was a timing glitch between what these three arms uh, are doing, it could end up damaging the car, right? So really, uh, this system, uh, you can think of as a distributed real-time system. So it's, it's a, ne a networked system that, that has to satisfy real-time constraints for correct operation. So um, hopefully these examples have illustrated that time is, uh, is central to the correctness of cyber-physical systems. And there are several properties that involve time that uh, we have to be able to uh, uh, verify. So in particular, one property... Uh, which is the example that I, uh, that I showed a couple of slides ago, is a threshold property. So you have a program, and you ask the question of, you know, can the program take more or less time than it is supposed to? 
Uh, another classic uh, uh, problem is to estimate how long a program might take in the worst case. Um, for soft real-time systems, you might not uh, uh, need uh, to answer the worst case uh, question, but you might want to know what the distribution of execution times is, uh, and so forth. And there, may, there are other tasks which, uh, which require accurate timing constraints. So uh, I want to spend a couple of slides talking about what is hard about this problem of timing analysis. So um, uh, very simply, here's uh, what we want. We have a program, and we want to construct a tool that will take this program, and then it will output uh, the time taken by this program. And if you're interested in worst case analysis, then, then it's the worst case time taken by this program. So the first thing that we come up against is um, that, that this problem in general is undecidable, uh, because it involves uh, figuring out if that program terminates. Um, so um, fortunately for us in the cyber physical systems world, uh, uh, the programs are written in a way that we can assure themselves of its termination. So uh, for instance, um, if a program has a loop, then you need to st uh, statically uh, know a bound on how long, how many iterations the loop will take. And similarly, uh, we typically know bounds on uh, recursion depth. So to give you an example of a, of, of a program uh, in this domain, uh, here's a, a snippet of code from an unmanned aerial vehicle controller. Um, so traditionally, the, the way these, these, the code is structured is you have uh, an infinite loop which is always executed uh, throughout the lifetime of the system. Um, but what we're really interested in analyzing are the timing of tasks that are called within this loop. And the task could have a structure like this, which encodes a state machine as a switch statement in C. Um, and then, uh, in particular, you can have other tasks. And typically, uh, the code looks quite something like this. You have uh, a bunch of conditionals. You may have floating point arithmetic. Um, but even if you have loops, it's possible to unroll them to have uh, a structure like this. So even with this subset of terminating programs, timing analysis is still hard. And uh, the problem with this picture is that um, the, this, as described in this picture, the problem is ill-formed. Okay? And the reason is that the program timing depends not just upon the program, but it depends heavily on the environment of the program. So it depends on the platform, which includes the, the microprocessor it runs on, the details of the memory hierarchy, um, possibly the operating system, uh, you know, other threads that may be running. Uh, if the program talks to the network, it depends on, on uh, delays in the network, and so on. So, um, so this is a, a harder problem than has traditionally been addressed by techniques like model checking, because the environment has to be also be modeled. And there's, there's way too much uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to accurately model here, uh, at least by humans. So if you were to make a list of all the factors that affect execution time um, in, in modern um, hardware, uh, and software, uh, uh, it's, it's very easy to fill an entire slide and more. Um, and so uh, the current state of the art for timing analysis uh, makes a lot of simplifying assumptions. So what they typically do is uh, you assume that your program is not only terminating, but it's sequential. Uh, there are no interrupts, no threads. Um, and uh, the platform is also assumed to be fairly simple. Typically, it's a single core processor uh, with, uh, with a data instruction cache. Um, and the way these techniques operate is that they, they construct a timing model. Uh, this is typically manually constructed. And uh, the main problem, uh, the main obstacle uh, to these techniques is that constructing a timing model like this is, uh, uh, is a tedious task. It can take several man months to construct. And uh, it also uh, lim uh, limits the, the, these techniques to do only do extreme case analysis. So, um, so in our work, we've tried to do, take a, a rather different approach. Um, instead of having humans construct these timing models, we try to leverage the advances in machine learning to automatically infer a, a timing model of the platform. Uh, and in, in our case, the timing model tends to be specific to the program you want to analyze. Um, in particular, uh, we, uh, we generate, uh, we, we carefully choose the measurements from which we uh, generate a timing model. More formally, this process of estimating timing is modeled as a game uh, between two players, uh, the, the tool that we're designing and the platform. And um, uh, very briefly, the tool uh, gets to select the, uh, the various execution paths that the program can take. 
And the platform is implicitly assumed to be uh, an adversary who can select the st its, its own state. So um, some of the challenges that we faced is, uh, um, uh, are, are really challenges that uh, one sees in formal methods in general. Um, so uh, for programs, uh, you can have a, an exponential number of behaviors uh, to explore. Um, you have an exponential number of platform states uh, to explore. And also, uh, one of the challenges in this area is that um, um, hardware manufacturers don't always um, um, reveal all the details of their uh, designs. And so you have a lack of visibility into uh, specific details of the platform, such as cache policies. So uh, I want to give you a sense of um, uh, the, the, the size of the, the space that one has to explore in order to do this analysis. So uh, one of the examples we looked at uh, was an automotive window controller. Um, as programs go, it's not very big. It's about 1,000 lines of C code. But if you look at the total number of program paths, it's just huge. It's of the order of 10 to the 16. And uh, really, this program is encoding a huge state machine uh, with a lot of switch statements and if statements. And there are several paths that one can take through this uh, code. Uh, to, give, to give a sense of scale for those who haven't seen uh, this before, uh, the number of stars in our galaxy is of the order of 10 to the 11. Right? So we have in this pr program, we have more paths than the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so the way our approach works, um, very briefly, uh, is to combine um, uh, online learning with techniques that we used in the voting machine project, satisfiability modular theories. And uh, the way it works is we start with a program. And uh, we extract a graph, a control flow graph that represents the program. And instead of exploring all the potentially exponentially many paths, we only explore a, a subset of paths, uh, a linear size subset of paths that forms a basis for the space of all paths. Uh, and th that's the basis in the, in the linear algebra sense. And then for these paths, uh, we invoke these SMT solvers to generate uh, test cases that will cause the program to execute those paths. And then once we have these test cases, uh, we run measurements on the actual hardware, where we run these test cases and measure the, the total number of CPU cycles that the program takes on these test cases. And this is done in, in an online loop um, where there's a learning algorithm that constructs a model of uh, how the platform affects the program's execution time. And at some, time, at some point in this process, we stop, and uh, we can then predict various uh, properties uh, of the program. So for instance, you can say, you can, you can ask a question of what is the, an estimate of the worst case execution time, and we can produce an estimate. Um, okay, so to give you an, a, a, a comparison point, for this automotive window controller, um, although the total number of program parts is 10 to the 16, uh, the number of basis parts that we need to execute is, is less than 200. So, um, so that gives us a, a, a a, a, a huge benefit in terms of uh, being able to scale to fairly uh, complex uh, programs, programs with several parts. Um, so we have both theoretical and experimental results. I wanted to share with you uh, uh, a pictorial view of one of the theoretical results we have in this area. This is on estimating the distribution of execution times uh, of a program. So the, the plot on the top uh, shows uh, an example of what a, the true distribution might be. So this is a histogram where the x-axis is time and the y-axis is the frequency with which the program exhibits the, a particular uh, a time value. And the bottom plot shows uh, the kind of predicted plot that we will generate, which tends to be a smoothing of the original uh, uh, distribution plot, where we can bound uh, the inaccuracy that we have. So, the, so any epsilon window of times in the original distribution will expand to an epsilon plus two xi distribution where we have bounds on xi. So I don't have time to, talk, to go into the, uh, the formal details, but, uh, but we have a way of bounding uh, th this uh, error in terms of parameters of the, of the program and the platform. Um, so in practice also we've seen that we can, uh, we can estimate distributions uh, quite accurately. So here's an example uh, from the crypto domain. Uh, we took a, a, a piece of code that does modular exponentiation, which is uh, a core uh, 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 function in many crypto algorithms. And uh, we showed that um, uh, here, for instance, the, 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 the measured distribution is in red, and our predicted distribution is in blue. And for the most part, we're, we're able to uh, uh, um, estimate this distribution quite accurately 
uh, with with perhaps a few cycles of in some cases. Um, but the but the thing the key thing is that here this was a program with 256 parts, and our predictions were made from by making just nine measurements. Okay, so to summarize this portion, um, I think timing is, is central to cyber physical systems. Um, and the challenge in verifying these kinds of timing properties is that they depend uh, both on the, not just on the program, but also on the hardware platform. And um, um, what we found is that by combining traditional formal methods with uh, learning techniques, uh, we can address uh, this problem uh, to some extent. And uh, as a future direction, we're thinking of going beyond time to analyze other kinds of properties. Uh, such as, for instance, energy consumption. Okay, so that brings me to the, the last part of this uh, lecture, uh, which is to show how formal methods could apply um, even at the circuit level. So I talked a little bit about the need for uh, um, error-resilient hardware um, and to, uh, to deal with a range of uh, faults. I'm going to focus now on uh, just transient faults, uh, single bit flips. Okay, so these are also called soft errors. Uh, so these are uh, uh, soft errors are, are, are uh, transient bit flips um, uh, that can happen in various uh, parts of uh, your uh, digital circuit. So it could happen in memory or in um, in flip flops uh, or even in combinational logic at the outputs uh, or uh, in gates. And um, uh, there are mainly two causes. Um, one is uh, the emission of alpha particles from packaging. And the second is from cosmic radiation. And um, there have been studies made on um, how much of uh, the soft error rate in uh, microprocessor designs comes from these various kinds of bit flips in, in various parts of the, of the logic. Um, fortunately, um, there are several circuit level and architectural techniques to deal with uh, soft errors. Uh, so what I have on this slide is uh, a particular latch design that was uh, created at Intel. It's called uh, Bizer, built-in soft error resilience. And uh, the main point is that all techniques for error resilience or fault tolerance have to use some redundancy. There has to be redundancy either in space or in time. So either you duplicate elements um, and then compare their outputs, or uh, you uh, roll back and retry. And um, th these re this redundancy effectively comes at a cost. Uh, for instance, uh, an additional power cost. So in this particular design uh, from Intel, what they've done is they've taken um, the, uh, the original latch and duplicated it. And uh, they store an output bit from, uh, that, is, that is computed uh, in both of these latches. And then the outputs of these two latches is fed to uh, a, a component called uh, a C element. And the C element has the property that uh, if it's, uh, its output only changes if both its inputs agree. So, um, so therefore, if, for instance, there, there was a, a bit flip in one of these two latches, then uh, these outputs will not agree, and therefore it, the, the error will not propagate through the C element. So, um, so there are, this is just one example. There are, there are a, a menu of techniques uh, that one can use to protect against soft errors. Um, but they all come at this cost. So the question we addressed was, how can we use formal methods to reduce this cost, to only use these uh, error-resilient design techniques where you really need them? Okay? And so the way uh, uh, the process works is we, um, we take in the, the original circuit design, a description of that, along with uh, a formal specification of what the, the design is supposed to do. But this is at a high level. This is in terms of the end-to-end uh, um, the, uh, the, the -end specification, at the software level or at the, the whole system level. And, um, and then we also take uh, a characterization of the kinds of faults that can occur. And then we use this, the technique of model checking to output a classification of uh, the components that you want to make error resilient. So for instance, in this, uh, the work in using Bizer, uh, we want to classify latches as being either um, uh, those that we must harden, we must use the Bizer technique, and those where we don't have to use the Bizer technique. Um, and so uh, we've applied this to several examples. Um, here's a sample example of, uh, of, of a design that we applied it to. Uh, so this design implements the SpaceWire uh, protocol. SpaceWire is a, uh, is a standard 
uh, for use uh, for communication aboard spacecraft. It originally was proposed by the European Space Agency, uh, but I understand now that it's, it's getting more widely adopted, uh, not just by the ESA, but by NASA and the Japanese agency. Um, so essentially think of it as a protocol like TCP, which would, which would define how uh, nodes and routers on board a spacecraft uh, can communicate. So uh, we took an, an, an uh, openly available implementation of Spacewire uh, in Verilog, and we did an analysis on that for uh, a few hours. And what we showed is that uh, there's a large fraction of latches that don't really have to be hardened towards soft errors, simply because the protocol itself defines ways of dealing with these errors in terms of uh, resets and retries. And um, by doing this analysis, we were able to show that you can reduce uh, the power overhead of using something like Bizer uh, by a significant factor, so an 81% reduction in power overhead. So um, this is another example of where uh, I think formal methods can be used in a slightly different way uh, to be able to uh, guarantee that you have a fault-tolerant or error-resilient circuit, but at a lower uh, overhead, a lower cost, uh, than you would if you, uh, if, you ha if you just blindly made the circuit uh, fault tolerant. Okay, so to conclude, um, I think we need uh, techniques for dependability at all levels of computing abstractions, and I've described uh, these three uh, projects that we've done in electronic voting, um, in uh, verifying timing properties of uh, so cyber physical software, and um, in doing fault analysis for hardware. Thank you. Questions from here? Okay, well, great talk. Thank you once again. Thank you.